Hello, uh, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about carbon capture and storage. So this is another one of my basic primer series to give people a basic understanding of what's going on in the energy space. So why CCS? Well, about 20% of US energy comes from non-fossil fuels. It's kind of similar in other countries. 80% comes from, uh, from gas, oil and coal. Now, the non-fossil part is growing. But it's kind of not growing fast enough, and there's bits that we can't really substitute. So this is a flowchart of uh, energy from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, a big U.S. Uh, institute. And the U.S. energy consumption 22 totaled 100.3 quadrillion British thermal units, which just kind of makes it handy to cal calculate percentages. So this is the portion that's going to electricity, about 37%. And about 20% of the 37%, 20% of the overall energy uh, energy usage is electricity generated using fossil fuels. So that's coal and natural gas. Now, obviously, that needs to be abated. Some of that may be reduced by growing uh, nuclear, by growing renewables, perhaps growing hydro. But some of that will always be there, particularly with renewables, which are intermittent and need backup. So what are we going to do about the emissions here? And then you have the industrial space, which is the space here. So that's... Uh, coal, uh, gas and oil going into industrial processes, petrochemicals, etc., which you can't really displace very effectively with non-fossil things. So again, um, what do we do about it? So roughly 40% of US CO2 uh, of energy use comes from uh, hydrocarbons, which generate CO2, which may need to be captured and stored in if you want to reduce your carbon emissions. So that's the why. So now the what? Well, what is CCS? Well, you capture CO2 emissions at source, so for example, thermal power plants, steelworks, cement factory, etc. Transport the CO2 to a storage site, by pipeline, for example. Inject the CO2 into storage site via wells. And the storage sites could include depleted oil and gas fields, saline aquifers, coal seams, which is a bit of a minority thing, and also using CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. And then you monitor it for leakage. So this is the diagram here from uh, the carbon uh, institute. Uh, uh, Cooperative Research Center for Greenhouse Gas Technologies. So you've got your sources, you generally tend to be industrial uh, large scale emitters, then that's transported, and then you can either put it into aquifers, use for CO2 for enhanced oil recovery, put it into depletion and harbor hydrocarbon reservoirs. Those are the main ones that are used. There's also some slightly more exotic ones which they talk about here about coal seams and perhaps basalt, etc. But these are very much minority, they're very much new. This is how most of it happens. So a little bit about basic geology. Now, again, it's kind of a little bit of an inverse of an oil field. So you have a, an aquifer or a storage reservoir. So that's a porous rock with permeability. Then you have a ceiling rock on top of it to keep uh, whatever gas you inject in. You access it via an injection well, which pumps the gas along. Um, you need a trap, uh, like a hydrocarbon trap. Uh, CO2 is, is buoyant and float upwards if not trapped. And the depth of burial needs to be sufficient for supercritical fluids. So I'll come to that in a second. So it's kind of similar to a hydrocarbon prospect, but you don't need a, a source because you're pumping in uh, CO2 gas. And you can define suitable aquifers and seals using geological mapping, and then you map out potential traps uh, for your CO2. So supercritical fluid is uh, fluid in a supercritical phase. So you have gas, you have liquid, you have solid. This is where you want to be because it's dense. So you can put more CO2 in, but it behaves like gas. So it's the best condition for storage. And that happens to be when you have a significant pressure and significant temperature. So you need something that's basically deep enough. And this is uh, something that a lady called Stephanie Flood. She's a postdoctorate researcher in the subject. And this is different types of uh, mapping. So you have structural trapping, which is the main thing that you've got here. Then you have dissolution mineral trapping. So when uh, the CO2 reacts with uh, with uh, the rocks to form carbonate cements, and you have residual trapping with CO2 saturated brine, which is a little bit dense and tends to float downwards. So again, please check out some of her work, and uh, you'll get a better understanding of the situation. Classification. So this is from uh, paper Bachu et al. Uh, 2007. So you have your theoretical capacity, your effective capacity, looking at basic scale. So it's a bit like play a fair way evaluation, basically. And then you have your match capacity to site deployment. So your capacity is your gross stock volume, multiplied by the net to gross, multiplied by the porosity, multiplied by CO2 density, multiplied by an efficiency factor. An efficiency factor is a possible part of the poor volume, which may be filled by CO2. It can range up to 40%. Obviously, it depends very much on the local situation. And this is some capacity um, 
definitions, uh, basically based on PRMS. Now, this is for put together by my former colleague, Bob Harrison. Please do check out some of his posts on LinkedIn. He talks a lot about carbon capture and storage in a very accessible way. Uh, but you can see it's complicated. You've got all these different standards and we kind of really need to unify it. Then you have your project stages within uh, that. Now it's a little bit, again, like classification within oil fields. So again, looking at play, looking at prospect, looking at discovery, etc. So you start at the plays, start at sequences, potential leads, potential prospects. So these are areas which might be suitable for CO2 injection. Then you do appraisal work to try to figure, get it to a situation where the site is potentially permit ready. And then you approve it for development and then you inject. So this is the hoops we have to go through like we do in, 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 in upstream and upstream oil field to make sure that uh, these things are all done in a safe and, and uh, suitable manner. Again, resource evaluation. Again, this is another picture from Bob. This is looking at the Bonta sandstone, uh, Triassic sandstone off the eastern coast of uh, the UK. So you can see this is the east coast of Britain. That's Humberside, that's Teesside, two big industrial clusters. And these are potential storage sites that have been identified within the Bonta sandstone. It's above the southern gas basin in the North Sea, so it's reasonably well understood. You build geo regional geological models, identify potential traps. Again, these are uh, uh, for a dip closures, anticlines that are formed by the underlying zechstein salt. Now, the Bonta sandstone doesn't have much in the way of hydrocarbon potential because basically the zechstein salt prevents the source uh, contact between the carboniferous source and the uh, Triassic reservoir. But uh, there are a couple of fields as Hewitt down here and there's the Edison, Forbes, Gordon, uh, Gordon up here. But generally, most of these structures have never been charged with hydrocarbons. Then you need to think also about fluid geochemistry, how the aquifer reservoir reacts with CO2. You have to look at potential dangers of uh, human-made leaks. So, for example, badly cemented old wells. You have to look at potential subcrops and outcrops where it could leak sideways. So you build a geological and dynamic static uh, reservoir model, just like you would do for an old prospect, but on a slightly larger scale and slightly more detail. And a former colleague of mine, Ian Barron, talked quite a lot about that on some of his work. Status of CCS worldwide. So... Um, this is from this Global CCS Institute, and these are operational projects. So quite a few in the USA, quite a few in Canada, one in Brazil, there's some in uh, the Middle East, a few in Europe, a couple in Norway, and then one in uh, Hungary, a few in China, and then uh, this is Gorgon in Australia. So again, a growth in potential developments that are going in there, CCS grows as we try to mitigate carbon emissions while keeping our industrial facilities going in order to maintain people with a reasonable lifestyle. In terms of future projects, now there's quite a few projects that are in early development, some in advanced development, again, quite a lot in the UK and other parts of Europe, some in China, some more in Australia, another one in the Middle East, and then quite a few more in the USA, Canada. Again, there are different business models, and Oxford Institute of Energy Studies did quite a good paper a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago looking at the different business models that are there. Looking at potential source hubs, so this is looking at the other way again. This is posted by Eddie Ong and LinkedIn, this is from McKinsey. So these are looking at different types of uh, potential point sources. Again, CO2, you're not going to get a carbon dioxide pipe from your house boiler, but you will do from a large steel plant, a large thermal power plant, cement factories, fertilizer plants, heavy industry, etc. So you've got clusters in America, clusters in China, clusters in India, and a scattering of heavy industry around the world. Again, some of these would be in countries that are more CCS friendly. Some of these would be in countries which are not really that bothered. But again, this is a potential business opportunity within uh, within the sphere. If you're looking at Europe, uh, this is uh, looking at potential um, constructed and completed uh, CO2 plants. This is looking at uh, potential um, advanced and early development plants for injection of CO2, and this is looking at potential point sources. So again, you're trying to link the source with the plant. Now, for example, there's a, a big gas field called Morecambe Bay in uh, off the northwest coast of England that's being potentially fed into these two big industrial clusters in uh, in um, northwest England. Big cluster in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, northwest Germany, etc. They're doing quite a bit of work there, and a few in Norway. This is Snovit, an LNG plant in Norway. So again, you're looking at potential projects throughout the world and trying to match uh, you know, a CO2 source with uh, potential CO2 storage. 
Recent licensing around the UK, the North Sea Transition Authority, uh, used to be the oil and gas authority, they're now moving into broader things. So they had a licensing ground for potential storage in uh, CO2, of CO2 in the United Kingdom. So this is uh, Southern Gas Basin, mainly with Ubuntu Sandstone, but also Rotligand. This is Morecambe Bay, which I've just talked about in the Irish Sea. This is the Captain Fairway, Cretaceous Sandstone in the Outer Murray Firth, and also potential uh, sites west of Shetland. Again, how many of these things will progress, we don't know, but this is something which is going to grow and going to grow forward. So this is a map from Westwood Energy that analyzes a particular licensing ground. So some example projects. Now, this is a bit of the daddy of the projects, which is Sleipner. This is a gas field in Norway. So you can see the Paleocene Reservoir here, and you can see the Utsira, which is a, a, a younger sandstone. And this was used as a storage site. Now, Sleipner has a very CO2-rich gas. In order to get development, they needed to uh, reduce CO2 emissions going to source. Therefore, what they did was uh, basically separated the CO2 within the gas processing plant on the platform and re-injected it into this uh, aquifer here. And this is uh, how far the CO2 has been injected. This is a 4D seismic, so time-lapse seismic, showing the effects of the CO2 plume. It's a study where um, Statoil, now Equinor, have been giving quite a lot of data to other people. So this is a bit of an example of how to follow. Again, posted by Eddie Ong on, uh, on his uh, uh, posts on LinkedIn. This is another example project, which is Gorgon. This is in Australia. Again, a situation where you have a liquefied ga natural gas plant on, the, on shore. You're then trying to... Uh, this produces a lot of CO2 as a point source and trying to move uh, that CO2 into a safe place in order to try to reduce uh, your emissions. This is operated by Chevron with uh, other ventures, ExxonMobil, Shell, Tokyo Gas and Saka Gas. Again, this is looking at this in Barrow Island, Western Australia. CO2 is stored locally, and this is trying to capture CO2 from gas processing plants. So those are two examples. There are quite a few more. So storage costs, again, this is put together by Eddie Ong. So you have different types of industry. Um, some are easier to others. So for example, chemicals, natural gas processing, um, ethanol, ammonia, and other petrochemicals and uh, tend to be very more CO2 low cost. Slightly higher cost for uh, hydrogen production. So this is effectively um, turquoise hydrogen, I think it's called, where you um, produce hydrogen from, uh, from methane or, the, or other hydrocarbons and then store the CO2 as a byproduct. And this is from uh, power generation, cement, iron, and steel. Again, uh, possibly valuable, but direct air capture, maybe not. And these are different storage costs, again, put by the International Energy Agency. Again, put together by De Jong on, the, on his website. So what are the barriers to progress in terms of CCS? Well, fundamentally, it's a waste management business. Uh, so slow margin, it's some risk. And there's significant barriers because basically it's about the cost of CO2. If your CO2 is relatively cheap, i.e. in terms of carbon taxes, whether they exist at all, well, you're going to do it? No. CO2 is expensive. You have to pay a high carbon tax. Then you uh, need to do CCS to try to offset that. Again, different industries, different countries. And you need to control the cost to be able to do it relatively profitable. Um, now, heavy emitters and less green countries who may export worldwide, what are the government regulations, and there's also high for upfront capex. Also, there's attitudes of government society, which vary quite a lot worldwide. You know, some uh, countries and territories tend to be a lot more carbon phobic, to use a word, whereas others tend to be a lot more, uh, a lot less carbon uh, worried. So, what well, the concerns regarding long-term storage intensity? Now, we need to reassure people on that. The concerns are actually relatively low. Potential carbon tariff walls, industrial decline in greenest countries. What are the other decarbonisation? So there's a lot of things to worry about. So as a sum up, it's an emerging technology. Now, there have been successful pilot projects. We can do it. We can reduce emission sectors that are hard to decarbonise. Heavy industry, trying to meet low carbon targets while maintaining industrial lifestyles. There's several business models that are there now. Oxford Energy have looked at that. Uh, please have a look at their website. And there's some innovative, innovative engineering within that. But we got significant barriers regarding costs and regulations. We need storage security reassurance, common industry standards, and we have compete against other decarbonisation and varying attitudes worldwide. So there's two things here from my friend Bob. So this is, uh, you know, yes, we need another competing standard. Well, let's just get one standard together. 
and EOR, Enhanced Oil Recoveries. Exxon loves Enhanced Oil Recovery, but I'm called EOR. So thank you very much. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.